Welcome everyone to Global Forum 2021. I'm James Dedarian, the Director of the Center for National Security Studies here at the University of Sydney, and I'll be hosting today's webinar, Friends, Enemies, and Interests, Critical Perspectives on AUKUS. We're still in lockdown in Sydney. It's week 15, so I'm coming to you from an undisclosed location. Um, actually, I'm in my uh, porch. It has the best acoustic separation in the house, but there might be uh, a barking dog at one point. But I do wish to assure you that what we lack in production values, we more than make up with the quality of our speakers who I'll introduce in a minute. First, a word to our newcomers about the CIS Global Forum, which we first created in 2018 to bring together um, international experts to explore the most pressing global issues in a critical and timely manner. These are designed as interim reports to fill the space between the first media flashes of a global event and then the long roll of thunder that follows sometimes months later in journal articles. And um, we try to help frame uh, the narrative in that way. Now, uh, as you can tell from our subtitle, Critical Perspectives, uh, the forum comes with a cutting edge and we draw on the critical legacy of two great Australian scholars. The first was the political philosopher, John Anderson, who taught at the University of Sydney for more than 30 years. And um, I just wanna give you a quote here. He taught under the rubric that the Socratic education begins with the awakening of the mind to the need for criticism and to the uncertainty of the principles by which it's supposed itself to be guided. So there you have it, the need to offer always questions, call into question sometimes the commonplace assumptions that um, underlie many of these big global events. Now, the second uh, uh, great Australian scholar was my mentor and supervisor and one of Anderson's most famous students. He was the international relations theorist, Hedley Bull, who wrote, and again, I quote, that inquiry has its own morality and is necessarily subversive of political institutions and movements of all kinds, good as well as bad. So there you have it. Now, this topic of Global Forum 2021 like the previous one on the COVID crisis, lessons learned, what next? The topic pretty much chose itself with the announcement by Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States of a new trilateral security partnership, as you now know, uh, also known as AUKUS. And um, the title of our, our Global Forum 2021 draws on that popularization of something that Lord Palmerston, the prime minister in the 1840s to the 1850s of Britain said in a speech to the House of Commons, we have no eternal allies and we have no perpetual enemies. Our interests are eternal and perpetual and those interests there's our duty to follow. Now, since then many a realist, that school of thought in international relations where all is anarchy outside states and you always have to assume the worst and prepare for the worst. And this is, um, been shortened by people like Henry Kissinger, and indeed the idea there are no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, only perpetual interests. Now the partnership in question is an Indo-Pacific expansion of the Anglophone special relationship forged in the words of President Biden in the trench fighting in World War I, the island hopping of World War II, the frigid winters in Korea, and the scorching heat of the Persian Gulf. The partnership shares a willingness to take on the threats of the 21st century, just as we did in the 20th century. This is Biden saying, we will do this together. Now, the actual name of that threat went unnamed during the virtual television announcement, but everyone knew just who that threat was. We'll be getting into that in our presentations. Now, we'll hear more about all of this. We do know that the news had a mixed reception depending on which country's press one read, obviously breaking a $60, million, a $60 billion contract with France did not go down well in Europe. Sub snub, stab in the back were some of the more familiar headlines. ScoMo and Bojo competed for the title of the most perfidious Anglo-Saxons. Johnson replied in less than diplomatic French, donnez-moi on break. Morrison kept getting a busy signal. I think he still is on his attempt to call Paris. Now, lost in this media spasm was a much broader sense of the, the partnership, which is a, a commitment that includes much more than submarines. 
It is an enhanced, I quote, strategic partnership. It includes substantial investments, collaborative innovations, cooperative initiatives in climate change, critical technologies, space exploration, exploration, exploitation, and higher education. So this has ramifications that reach much further beyond a, a weapon system. So we've invited a, a great group of CIS members for our first in the series. The following series will be curated by our, our program leaders for the different research programs of CIS, and we'll have international guests. But today we're bringing together uh, experts, regional, global security experts, and we try to make this as interactive a program as possible. So any questions you have should be submitted through the Q&A function there at the bottom of your screens. So to get started, let me just briefly introduce our panel. Uh, we have Justin Hastings, who's a professor of international relations and comparative politics here at the University of Sydney. He's, he's an expert on Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, East Africa. He looks at terrorism, smuggling, maritime piracy, insurgency, gray and black markets, and indeed also nuclear weapons proliferation. Peter Hayes is also a member of CIS, associate member, but he's the director of the Nautilus Institute, an associate member here. I don't know of anyone who's more consistently tackled some of these intractable global issues that are in this interface of security, environment, and energy. And Brendan O'Connor, he's an associate professor in American politics within the United States Study Center. His research interests include anti-Americanism, American uh, presidential politics, U.S. foreign policy, and Australian-American relations. Aim Sinpeng, who we last saw bicycling to get to this uh, webinar, and I hope she's made it back home, is a senior lecturer and co-founder of the Sydney Cybersecurity Network at the University of Sydney. Her interests include comparative democratization, authoritarianism, digital media and politics, southeastern politics, and internet governance. Glad to have her with us. And Thomas Wilkins, who will be wrapping it up, is our senior lecturer here at the Sydney, uh, at the University of Sydney. He specializes in security studies. Uh, he has particular emphasis on the Asia Pacific region. He's steeped in the international history of military conflict. And um, quite recently, he's written on this whole issue of alliances in the Indo Pacific. So I think we're well served to get behind the headlines and to tackle some of these issues. And to get started, we, I decided to start broad. If, if, if the ultimate you know, concern of international security is what makes us safe, the question I want to pose to each of you, just you know, give me your, 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 your five minutes on what you believe will be the outcome of this AUKUS uh, strategic partnership. But most importantly, will it make Australia safe, safer? I mean, if we treat this as the primary concern, and then perhaps branch out you know, in terms of what does it mean in terms of regional politics and also global security. So we're gonna begin with Justin. I'm gonna um, hand over the screen to him and we'll hear from him first. The screen is yours, Justin. Okay, thanks. Uh, let, me, let me set a timer so I don't uh, exceed five minutes. So I think the question is sort of whether this makes Australia safer or not. Um, I, I think anytime we're talking about this agreement, we should be clear it's actually a technology sharing agreement um, more than necessarily a, an alliance since the US, the UK and Australia were already allies um, technically. Um, and they already have a number of agreements in terms of um, alliances and, and a lot of intelligence sharing and, and sort of army and Navy um, alignments. And so the question is sort of, I mean, in some sense, what does this agreement actually do? Uh, and, and my concern um, sort of when we think about the AUKUS agreement is as a technology sharing agreement, um, you know, the timelines for procurement of this technology are, are going to be quite long, right? We're thinking about the, um, you know, acquiring a nuclear submarine and actually running it. You know, we could be looking at as many as uh, 20 years um, before this actually happens. Um, and so in some sense, there's a disjunct between what the signals, which is closer Australian alignment with, with the US and UK and what's actually delivered, right? Um, and sort of the question is, well, what do we do in the meantime, right? Um, you know, so you know, sort of left unsaid at the announcement was, the, um, was China being the target, 
potentially of this of this alignment. And the problem here is that you can easily see that um, the strategic conundrum posed by China is going to be peaking earlier than 20 years from now, right? Um, so if we think about, well, what, what, what are the issues that um, we might face with a, a rising China? Uh, it's things like the ability or the continuing ability of the US and its allies to deter China from attacking or otherwise um, sort of dealing uh, militarily with Taiwan. Uh, it's the ability to deter China from um, sort of engaging in belligerent acts in the, in the South China Sea. Um, sort of the, the ability to maintain supply chains uh, sort of, you know, in ways that sort of can't be disrupted by, by China and the ability to maintain good relations with countries in Southeast Asia. All of those are sort of things that are, we have to deal with now, right? Uh, and sort of a nuclear submarine that may appear in 20 years is not something that can actually deal with that, right? Um, and, and I think this, this creates, um, I think, a bit of a problem with certainly the signals closer alignment, but sort of how do we actually increase the credibility of this um, before sort of the nuclear subs and sort of this other technology actually arrives. Uh, and, you know, this is a particular problem now because the U.S. has a, a, a credibility problem, right? I mean, if you leave Afghanistan in the way that the U.S. left it, especially in sort of arguably sort of such a, a leadership vacuum as you currently see in the U.S., um, this leads to a problem. How does the U.S. show that it's actually able to make credible commitments? to its allies. Signing an agreement that says you'll share technology in 20 years is not necessarily going to do that very well, right? And so in some sense, the question, this is a question that they, they haven't really addressed with AUKUS yet. How do we address credit commitment issues now, All right? Uh, and I, I think this becomes an even bigger issue when you look at you know, the country's responses to it, right? Um, countries like Malaysia and Indonesia have been, I think, lukewarm about it. Uh, I think when all is, at the, you know, at the end of the day, they're not going to actually oppose it, but you know, they're lukewarm partly because they still don't want to have to choose between um, China and the US, right? And you know, in some sense, they, they don't want to have to do that partly because um, they may see advantage to, to align with China and partly because they, they don't necessarily see US commitments as credible, right? Um, and I think the question is, well, how can sort of AUKUS develop in a way that will actually allow um, the US and to a lesser extent Australia to, um, to make more credible commitments? I mean, to a certain extent, I think this will be addressed by China itself, right? I mean, the reason why any of this is happening at all is because China has very rapidly moved to a situation where it's essentially, its behavior has led to um, balancing against it, right? Uh, and this is what we're seeing, right? We're seeing a move away from the hub and spoke system uh, in East Asia and even to a certain extent in Southeast Asia uh, in terms of alliances towards a, a sort of more multilateral um, arrangements, which will never be as formalized as, as um, in Europe, for example more modular elements that do sort of at least indirectly target China. Why is that? Because China in some sense is behaving much more belligerently than, it's, than it's, it can back up militarily, right? Or even economically. Uh, and that's leading countries to um, take steps even before China has actually sufficiently risen to, um, to balance against it, right? And so I think the next five years or so will be quite important in deciding well how this plays out. Um, can sort of AUKUS in some ways um, demonstrate greater credibility now, uh, even as we wait for the technology to arrive um, in ways that will actually assuage concerns in the region about the commitment of, you know, the US and Australia to, to Southeast Asia and East Asia. Thank you, Justin, for getting us off to a good start. Uh, next, we're turning to Peter Hayes, the director of Nautilus, who will, um, I'm sure, set us straight on the, the, the issue of whether or not this makes Australia safer. Peter, it's all yours. Thanks very much, James. Well, I grew up when Muraroa was a real issue in Australia. In fact, we were dumping the milk on our dairy farm because of the radiation falling out of the sky that had gone right around the planet from the Polynesian French test. So I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for the French and what uh, really just boils down to an arms deal going, going wrong. Um, but I also don't particularly like the mendacity and abuse of another middle power working to create a multilateral coalition in this region to manage China's uh, transition and challenge to uh, the region. Uh, what I see us as doing is essentially hitching our wagon to the American locomotive in the most unambiguous and clear manner. Uh, to some extent, this is an attempt to couple uh, our future to that of American strategic deterrence, just as 
the United States did so with NATO uh, in order to impress on European minds the credibility of its commitment to their security, uh, except in this case, I think it's more Australia attempting to wrest that commitment from the United States. Now, I truly don't understand what strategic missions Australian nuclear-powered attack submarines would have in East Asia, the Indian Ocean, or the Northwest Pacific that could be possibly independent of American anti-submarine warfare and aircraft carrier operations. In the case of ASW, the most important mission of such a submarine is to track and destroy Chinese, Russian, and in the future, potentially North Korean ballistic missile uh, carrying and firing submarines, or to relieve American attack submarines to undertake that mission uh, by our uh, vessels uh, as part of a uh, shared war plan to undertake the control of narrow straits through which their submarines would have to transit or to act as a point guard for American aircraft carrier battle groups operating offshore from China or Russia or North Korea. Typically, there are two such submarines uh, attached to each battle group. Um, I also don't understand who exactly Australia's submarines would be targeting with sea launch cruise missiles except the Chinese communications command and control bases uh, on their east coastal uh, area. Uh, and due to the shared or dual capability of Chinese uh, 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 conventional and nuclear weapon systems, such an attack would present a direct threat to their land-based nuclear armed missile systems. Chinese missiles and warheads share the same nuclear command and control systems. And it's possible, it's impossible for us to know what they're loading on top of such a missile as they're getting it ready to launch and what strike orders are being sent. So if that's the prospective target of Australian sea launch cruise missiles, we'd be directly entering into the most dangerous aspect of an escalation spiral between the United States and China most likely over uh, the Taiwan Straits uh, problem. Now, all this talk, at least in public, has been mostly about China, but these type of operations also relate to the Russian submarines operating in the Sea of Okhotsk uh, and also in the Arctic. And it's interesting to note that American attack sub operations are already at a higher operating tempo out of Japan than they were at the peak of the Cold War. That's because the Russians now have three such submarines deployed in this region. And I really don't think we want to join that fray. Uh, and uh, it just seems to me that we don't have a lone wolf autonomous role for long range uh, attack submarine operations, except as part of an American force. It'll be utterly dependent on American command and control communications and intelligence infrastructure. Uh, we would not have the long distance capability to put submarines out there by ourselves. So I think what we probably really have in mind is to act as a choke point controller on the Philippines, Indonesia Straits to trap Chinese attack submarines or surface vessels in the South China Sea. And I guess on a sort of sardonic note, I'll conclude by not only noting that this is a very brittle technology, within the next 40 years, the ocean is probably going to be pretty transparent and the ability of submarines to get lost at sea will just disappear. But also those very militarized sites that we are so worried about in the South China Sea are just as likely to be obliterated by climate change induced superstorms over that time frame, uh, as they are by attack submarines. Uh, I'm very skeptical of this uh, whole strategy, and I think it's actually to do with Australian domestic politics. It has a huge opportunity cost for the ADF. I don't think it makes us safer, and it will also promote 
South Korean and Japanese to follow suit. And if they do so, they won't be stopping at attack submarines. They'll go the full Monty and go ballistic missile firing submarines. So I think we're also contributing to a proliferation dynamic in the region that is very dangerous. I'll stop there. Thank you, Peter. Very sobering analysis. I, I, I feel like uh, I'm picking up that book uh, on the beach and reading it again. It's a bit <laughs> dire uh, 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 perspective, but um, I'm glad you did bring up the issue, though, about you know what's the time frame here, because there's, there are seemingly some internal contradictions. They're on the one hand saying we have this to have this intensive collaboration on cyber, artificial intelligence, quantum, and even and, and drones, and yet all that technology merging would make submarines obsolescent, wouldn't they? Because the seas would be transparent if we used quantum gravity sensors. Underwater drones are much cheaper. You know, using a, a drone that costs millions to take out a submarine that costs billions is you know very cost-effective way of fighting asymmetrical warfare. And then you know, artificial intelligence being used to um, you know have autonomous drones, meaning that you know the only safe place for these submarines 30 years from now might be Sydney Harbor. Well, yes, I mean, there's an enormous amount of unpredictability there. And the question, however, that I think actually is more important than that uncertainty is whether this is a game that we think at a global level we should be playing. Do we make the world safer and therefore Australia safer by making the world safer? Or are we making the world more dangerous and therefore drawing nuclear fire onto Australia because you can be guaranteed the Chinese and the Russians aren't going to just sit on their hands and let the uh, sensor systems that are run from satellites through Pine Gap uh, instantly go back to Colorado and then be disseminated in strike orders or retargeting during a nuclear war uh, to hit the empty, uh, the, the still full silos in China. They're not just going to let that go ahead. So in the very course of deploying these submarines as part of these war plans, which are inherently dual capable. They're inherently about conventional and nuclear war. That's why we have nuclear weapons, is to stop conventional wars breaking out. That's what deterrence is meant to do, as well as stop the nuclear weapons being fired. Uh, they actually will be drawing fire onto us uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And I call that scenario not on the beach, but off the beach. And uh, I think Neville Shute, you know, got a lot right. Well, we'll get deeper into these questions about some of the contradictions here. It doesn't seem to be particularly well thought out in the strategic game about, you know, down the line knock-on consequences. But next we have Brendan O'Connor, who is a specialist in American-Australian relations. And um, Brendan, do you think this is going to make Australia safer? Well, in short, no. But in, in Samuel Huntington's controversial 1996 book, The Clash of Civilizations, he claimed that Australia was a torn country, torn between its Anglosphere history and alliances on one side and its movement into deeper relations with Asian civilization in the early 1990s on the other side. Over the last few days, I've been thinking, if only, uh, supposedly torn bicultural and multicultural people and nations are the smartest often, as they see and hear things from a variety of perspectives. In truth, the Australian government has never been torn. At our best, we have seen our, our Asian geography as an advantage in terms of diplomacy, immigration, cultural growth, and of course, economics. The announcement of AUKUS, in my view, is a backward step in terms of Australia's development as a nation and for its national security. Now, it's hard to judge any agreement uh, in its first month, so I don't pretend to have all the answers here, but I don't think it will make Australia safer. I think it has the possibility of boxing Australia in, as Peter's, I think, arguing, in certain foreign policy decision-making and defence decision-making, and may give us fewer options, which is an undesirable thing. With both parties, both political parties in Australia opposing AUKUS, opposition has fallen to the former Australian Prime Minister, Paul Keating, and some of those who worked for Keating, like Alan Gingell. Keating has voiced strong opposition to AUKUS for binding Australia too closely to the US, for displaying an old colonial mentality. He writes recently, at Morrison's instigation, Australia turns its back on the 21st century, the century of Asia, for the jaded and faded Anglosphere, the domain of the Atlantic 
a world away. Elsewhere, he's written it sort of is like making Australian foreign policy in Asia again through London. Since Keating was defeated in 1996, Australian foreign policy, I would argue, has generally been unimaginative, too closely linked to the US militarily and lacking deep engagement with Asia. Over the last 25 years, what would have signaled a greater commitment to deep engagement? I think continuous Australian efforts to strengthen and make APEC an organization that was never gonna be like the European Union, but at least moving in that direction. Strengthening DFAT with funding, having a greater diplomatic presence in the region, greater federal funding of the study of Asian languages, a perennial criticism in Australia, stronger engagement uh, to encourage Asian Australians to get involved in politics and diplomacy, and strong anti-racism campaigns in Australia to curb racism towards Australia. Since 1996, the goal of Australian foreign policy has often been at its centre, getting closer relations with the United States. This goal has led to the Australian government strongly encouraging the disastrous invasion and occupation of Iraq, voicing far too little criticism of the long and futile occupation of Afghanistan, and being as quiet and acquiescent as most congressional Republicans about the dangerous anti-democratic, anti-liberal presidency of Donald Trump. Our want to be close to the United States politically and militarily has not been good for us, and I'd argue it has not been particularly good for the United States. For those steeped in the Anglo-American democratic tradition, uh, you may recall the Federalist Papers, uh, 63, where James Madison writes, when America is warped by strong passions or momentary interest, it needs friendly nations to disagree with it, so it can be persuaded towards wiser courses of action. Given this track record and the possible return of Donald Trump or a Republican president who takes a highly aggressive posture towards China after being elected in 2024, Australia should be charting a more independent path from the US. Now, I don't take a benign view to the current Chinese leadership and their foreign policy, I worry, like many, about their exercises aimed at Taiwan, but I don't see there is any evidence that China poses a military threat to Australia territorially. I don't pretend to have all the answers here, but I'd like to help start a conversation about how Australia can engage in more productive diplomacy with China and play a more thoughtful middle power role, actively promoting more regional diplomacy. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Brendan, very much in that tradition of more jaw, jaw, less war, war. We, we appreciate critical perspectives, in particular at a time when it seems there's a lot of groupthink going on. And um, we're going to move next to AIM, who's a, AIM Sins Pang, who's a specialist in Southeast Asia, but in particular, she's uh, also got her ear to the ground in digital media, social media. So, AIM, first, you know, do you think this is going to make us safer? But secondly, do you, do you, what do you hear on the street in terms of the internet street about this? Aim, please, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, very divided. I thought I'll bring out the responses from governments of ASEAN as an example of, of you know, how we should think about AUKUS. So countries and governments in ASEAN range from embra full embracement uh, to uh, being really negative about it. Uh, but many of them are sitting on a fence. But I thought they particularly uh, the Malaysian defense minister uh, basically said in parliament that he was going to immediately set up a working group to go to China and ask what China thinks about it. And I thought that's so, you know, so telling that, first of all, everyone knows what China thinks about it already. So the fact that they're organizing a trip to go to China to ask China again uh, said that it doesn't in any way alleviate any kind of anxiety uh, in Southeast Asia where it's uh, Australia's immediate neighbor, but also that's where the, the, the China versus US, US um, um, uh, basically uh, is had its worst parts, right? Basically with, with the South China Sea. Uh, so, you know, I think it will change very little in terms of reducing any kind of anxiety uh, in the region about the, you know, the fears of potential arm race or, or increased 
a security concerns in the region, uh, given that, you know, basically the Philippines said, yeah, let's do it. And Singapore sort of, uh, but a lot of the other countries just said, we're really worried that this is going to make things worse in the region. Um, Thailand, for example, also uh, didn't want to say anything, even though Washington sent an invitation for them to come over until they uh, figure out what the Chinese are wanting to them to say. So I think a lot of the countries in the regions are just feeling like they've been doing their best to hedge against both nations. This is not making them feeling any safer. And therefore, they don't feel that uh, this this deal, however, you know, incognate is this at the moment, makes their region, um, especially in the South China Sea, feels any, any safer. The other thing I want to raise, I think, is that uh, those, this since the, the announcement came up, I think a lot of uh, a lot of attention has been paid on um, traditional security and not so much on the non-traditional security. And I think especially things like what's going on with technologies to fight uh, disinformation for interference, that's the biggest concern of Australia. And I, I don't think we have much clarity on that. And I, and I think just by signaling that Australia is going to be in this really important pact with the US, uh, is really not helping Australia to be safer in terms of uh, cybersecurity in, in the aspect of fighting disinformation. And because I think that those kind of cybersecurity threats, like uh, cyber uh, in, in a cyberspace, especially when it comes to foreign interference, um, public opinion manipulation, it's not really about the submarine. It's, it's about other types of security that we don't just need technologies to fix, but we need social solutions to fix. We need better understanding of what's really going on in terms of, you know, what can we do in Australia to not only just trying to address potential for interference in our institutions, but have a better understanding of where it's coming from. And I think having this deal I'm not sure what kind of technology sharing is going to be going on, but I'm hoping it's not just technology, but also uh, social and cultural understanding of how we can better understand this information coming uh, if they think the real threat actor is China and how we can bet, uh, best address that. And I think that's completely not discussed right now, um, but I think it's the threat that we are already facing that we need to address right now and not in 20 years, like Justin said. So in conclusion, I think looking at the responses from ASEAN, for example, the region that's basically trying to hedge between the US and, uh, uh, and, and China, the deal has not made their anxiety reduce and in some cases have made it worse. And the fact that half of the country's response is to call China and ask what China thinks says a lot about how they're feeling about their relationship with the US right now. And, I don't think that this deal is making them feeling safer. I don't think they feel that the region is safer by this deal. But secondly, more importantly, I don't think there's enough clarity whether this deal is going to make us safer in the cyber realm, especially when it comes to foreign interference and disinformation. Thank you very much, Anne. I think one of the reasons for putting together this forum on the fly is that there seems to be a a great deal of uniformity, largely from the top down, from think tanks, from you know the, the traditional foreign policy elites, that this is a good thing. And I think it's important to see what you know other perspectives are, particularly in the region, but also what what's the popular view outside of Australia? All too often, you know, dissent is stomped on as being unpatriotic. Are you witnessing that at all on digital media, on social media, or or how is it being expressed when, in your kind of surveillance of uh, the region's digital politics and digital media? Well, I can tell you that if you think the Chinese uh, public opinion machines are, are not already full throttle, they are. Uh, so if you're looking for opinions in the region, um, especially in the Southeast Asian regions about the deal in multiple languages, you're seeing the search results returning from media that are owned by China or yeah. supported by China, trying to counter uh, or at least um, showing rank down um, the results actually from um, media in the region that isn't owned by China or alternative opinions. So already that, you know, information warfare is already going. Yeah. Whatever is in the deal, the machine is on. 
So, right. uh, and we have, what, what does this deal bring clarity to this kind of situation, which happens daily? Um, um, and, and, and as, you know, people like Dustin know, um, China has been buying up media companies and organization in the region for a couple of decades now. Um, they've already got that covered. Um, they know the region is it's nervous, trying its best to be to, to be best friends to both. Um, and by being aggressive on the media front, um, which Australia is not doing at all, by the way, that not, 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 doesn't do anything with media engagement in the region. Um, I think that that does more than this deal might do for them in terms of creating this environment for either more insecurity or less than security. Thank you for that. Good, we're now turning to uh, Tom Wilkins, who's senior lecturer here, takes a long view on many of these issues, the historical view, and has written on alliances. Tom, your views on whether this makes Australia safe, safer. Thank you. Uh, thanks, James, and thanks for organizing this um, timely forum. So, uh, I mean, the brief answer to that is ask me in 20 years' time when the subs are actually deployed. <laughs> Um, I think in the meantime, um, the uh, the announcement of the, the AUKUS deal with the submarines is the, the centerpiece of this, um, and uh, you know, a lot of people are focused upon this as being the, the kind of the primary content of this, but I, I think, you know, you pointed out there's a lot more to this in terms of technology sharing, and I think there's some other aspects as well that I'll also mention. Um, I mean, basically, it doesn't count for more than a signaling of intent to acquire future capabilities at this stage. So in that sense, I'm quite in accord with Justin that this is this remains fairly symbolic, but that's important nonetheless. And when you dig deeper and see what the implications are and what might flow from this, you start seeing more substance to it, then, you know, I think we'll have a better um, sense of where this is going. I mean, in relation to um, the, the, the centerpiece of the, the submarine acquisition deal, I mean, in the experience of warfare to date, when conflict breaks out, you fight with what you've got already. <laughs> you fight with what you have, not what's on the drawing board. And so, you know, if a conflict breaks out and uh, you don't have the necessary capabilities, um, you're obviously um, not very safe. Um, I mean, a lot of people have pointed out, uh, I mean, uh, people like Greg Sheridan have said, well, you know, if the security environment is as bad as it's being portrayed by the government um, and the threat warning time is reduced, why aren't we doing more? Um, why aren't we doing moving things faster? Um, it's probably just worth mentioning as well that, uh, you know, there's sort of a bit of an implication here that it's Australia that's raising the regional tensions through improvement of its military capabilities. Um, I think that's probably uh, sort of perhaps looking in the wrong place for which country is, uh, is actually the one that is, uh, that is, is going full tilt with its military modernization and showing uh, various sort of, uh, you know, um, assertive or uh, aggressive signals that are, are really the main focus of, of regional instability here rather than Australia. This is a responsive and a reactive um, uh, situation on, on Australia's part. I mean, I would also go back to this idea of this uh, 20, you know, just to, to reiterate uh, a bit Justin's point, this 20 years um, procurement cycle, and it's gonna leave us with a significant capability or window of vulnerability while we you know, actually go through the, this immensely drawn out um, um, procurement process of which of course, there's no guarantee that there's gonna be success. We've already got ourselves into a pickle with this before. The Collins submarines were not exactly um, you know, uh, a smooth ride from, uh, from blueprints to, uh, to deployment and they've experienced a lot of problems ever since. Um, but uh, you know, it's also gonna be, you know, just to, to emphasize, this is gonna be an immense challenge for Australia. I mean, we just don't have the experience in such a, a you know, major high-end um, procurement project deploying such a high-end capability. Um, we lack the, um, the personnel with uh, nuclear expertise. Um, I think I was just, I, I could be wrong, but I think I was reading that, uh, you know, US uh, nu uh, nuclear powered submarine commanders have PhDs in nuclear physics or something. Well, we'd have to start training people pretty soon on that. 
whether we can actually crew these boats as well, since we've had trouble with the, the Collins class is, is another thing to think about. So it's an immensely complex process. Um, so anything could happen in this, you know, in this two decades. Um, so in the meantime, I mean, Australia has got to address this capability gap. I mean, the key thing is to extend the operational life of the Collins class subs. And then, you know, other sub analysts have suggested that we either um, seek to lease or kind of co-crew um, um, uh, as part of a leasing agreement, um, astute or Virginia class um, submarines with the, um, the UK or the US in the interim, um, if that's possible, or possibly the um, home port, um, uh, those boats um, in Australia for training purposes, etc. cetera, from, from the UK. Um, but uh, I don't think we should come, I mean, the you know, submarine deal is, is, is the centerpiece, but I think, uh, you know, there's other things that Australia is doing to, to kind of fill this gap in, in other ways. I mean, there's been a whole raft of things uh, uh, Peter Dutton has announced in terms of acquiring long range standoff missiles and things. Um, but then, um, so, you know, to try and uh, keep that, um, you know, protect ourselves in that window of vulnerability. Um, but I suppose the only sort of, the, the, you know, the, the main thing I would add to, because, you know, the, my colleagues have obviously covered a, a great deal of what I might have, might, might have said. Um, but the, the key thing that I, I'd like to perhaps uh, just emphasize in, in my own contribution is, um, that we have partnerships with, you know, as well as this, the, this, the ANZUS Alliance and this new AUKUS Pact and the, you know, very close relations we've had for the, with the UK historically. Um, we also have partnerships with other countries with very impressive capabilities. Japan is one, India is another one. And um, in some ways, this is just reinforcing this kind of diffuse network of these interlocking minilaterals rather than multilaterals. Multilaterals, we think of ASEAN and we think of their talk shops, but minilaterals that are very kind of much more more focused on practical cooperation, um, like the trilateral strategic dialogue between Australia, Japan, and the United States, and of course the the, the Quad. Um, and uh, and this also goes to this um, what I think is a bit of a red herring uh, about an, an, uh, this this Anglosphere argument. I you know I, I get the get the point and everything about that the Anglosphere, and it, I, I do think I, I mean why isn't it natural that uh, you know um, that we would look to uh, our closest allies that we have the longest um, tradition of kind of cultural, historical, um, military cooperation with um, in Washington and London, you know, from a bit biased on that, coming originally at home, I lived in the United States, so personal stake, you know, mentioned, but it seems perfectly natural to me that we, we would do that. But here's the thing, I don't think it really does compromise our um, uh, engagement with Asia at all. I, I don't buy this Keating argument at all. He's very... Um, I think out on a limb over this, even in labor. So, um, so I'm not so, so um, sort of uh, amenable to, to, to that argument. Um, because actually, you know, when you look at these, these interlocking partnerships that Australia has, it has incredibly close partnerships with other Asian countries. That's not part of the Anglosphere. And in fact, you know, Japan and India, um, for two, also Quad members, have gone, on, you know, have gone on the record saying that they feel that this is a positive development and, and it's actually beneficial to, to their perspectives on security. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, with, uh, uh, with all due respect to, to Thailand, um, that's not one of our partners. Um, I mean, the way that that's, that's viewed in Washington and Canberra is a little bit different from how we view, say, Singapore, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, but especially these key players, Japan and India, which are just on a whole different order of importance to us. And it does us lots of good with them and no harm. So I know that's taking issue a little bit with some of the, the, the previous comments, uh, but, but I think you know, all, the, all the arguments are valid, but that's that's how it looks from, from my circles. Thank you, James. Thank you, Tom. Now we encourage diversity of viewpoints at the whole purpose of the Global Forum. And I am afraid though that invitation to um, for that junket to Paris is going to be retracted now. Though I don't know if that's <laughs> going to come through. But uh, yes, the French are noticeably upset. It does raise the issue of credibility, though, and and that's important: credibility and trust in alliances. You know, we have some great questions popping up. I think I'm going to go right to them. And um, one gets to an issue we haven't quite dealt with, and that is getting behind the thinking you know we always think about strategic thinking about it's all about rational choice that underpins a lot of realist thinking 
that people always operate in the maximizing the benefits. And therefore we have to do this kind of exercise of worst case scenarios and view the world as dog eat dog. But, you know, Headley Bull, who is my mentor he, and supervisor, he, he often posed a different viewpoint about this and being Australian, um, you know, diasporic for a long period of his life. Nonetheless, he had a particular viewpoint on this. And Stuart Rollo, who's a, a PhD student, uh, a former PhD student, now a postdoc, has a great question. I'm going to just read it because it's um, a little complicated, but very, very, I think, apt. Here it goes. Here I go. Um, mentioning Headley Bull brought to mind his understanding of Australia's foundational existential anxiety, which he believes stem from our small population, vast resources, and conviction that our more populous and poorer Asian neighbors would at some point seek a redistribution of our continental bounty. Bull believed that this was in some sense a projection resulting from our own founding through the brutal and aggressive dispossession of indigenous people. Do our panelists believe that our acute fear of a rising China and our pivot to a posture of confrontation and containment of a country that has never directly threatened us is completely rational? Or does it or does this sort of foundational national psychology play a bigger part than many politicians and policy experts would like to admit? Now, who wants to uh, deep, you know, do a deep dive into the, the, the you know, other possibilities than rational choice and, and how these, these strategic formulations are made and justified? I think this goes deep in the writing of Australian foreign policy. Alan Gingell's recent book, um, Alan Renouf's kind of contributions on the frightened country, both get at this deep sense of fear of abandonment, fear of not being part of conversations and alliances. And I think that does play into a readiness to not be critical of say the decision to go to war in Iraq or not criticize the length of the engagement in Afghanistan or not even criticize Donald Trump when most other country, dem democratic countries felt very comfortable at that. So I think there is a fear, there is a strange domestic politics around kind of loyalty to the ANZUS Alliance, which hasn't gone away for 70 years uh, and is overstated, I think, in the sense of not being critical when criticism is actually being a, a better friend. Uh, and I think that this, I mean, Tom's point about bilateral relations in Asia, I think Keating's argument and Gingell's argument is really one back to regional architecture to say it's not about the bilateral relations. Of course, this might be useful for Japan or you know, other countries might see benefits in it, but it's about creating a forum where relations are taken away from being bilateral and that they're made into these multilateral conversations, which have a bit of a tendency, if you look at the European example, to diffuse, I think, some kind of rising tensions or sense of rising importance of particular nations. So I think the record, the record in Europe is, is, is a positive one to learn something from. I mean, it's not perfect, and we're probably not going to get to that sort of architecture, but I think it is an example worth discussing. Thank you, Brendan. Tom, uh, what do you think? Projection or something else? Yeah. Um, so uh, just before I come to that, I think uh, you know, I, uh, um, that uh, Brendan raised a really interesting point about the, the multilateral architecture there. But um, for, I think, you know, the majority of analysts that, that look at the multilateral architecture often, which is founded around ASEAN centrality, um, these are basically just talk shops, um, uh, you know, as they're often, you know, dubbed uh, as talk shops, but I mean, essentially they're multilateral security dialogues and it's really good to have people talking. They haven't solved a single problem um, in, in terms of like the major flashpoints or the major security issues of the region. And in fact, rather than sort of, sort of um, socializing China within these multilateral fora, we've actually seen like the division of, of countries, you know, within ASEAN, um, compromising ASEAN, ASEAN neutrality and ASEAN becoming almost a battleground uh, or an arena in which strategic competition between the United States and China plays out. So I don't hold out a great, I think they're important and it's, it's you know, it's good to talk, um, but I think, you know, actually, you know, the real security action is devolving to bilaterals and minilateral 
laterals. We're not just talking about bilaterals, but these mini laterals like August, like trilateral street dialogue, like the quad. But just to go back very quickly to um, this idea of the uh, uh, you know fear of insecurity and everything. Yeah, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, you know, um, I think that that does motivate Australia as part of its national um, psyche, and it's a very very interesting question, and I think it's a, a persuasive argument. Um, but um, the other thing is, you know, actions speak loud as well as ideas, and um, you know, uh, you know, the sort of uh, the uh, the kind of wolf warrior diplomacy and the way that Japan, that uh, China has projected itself um, towards Australia has been far from friendly and accommodating recently. If uh, you happen to have a chance to watch the uh, the interview that Stan Grant conducted with uh, Victor Victor Gao from from uh, Suzhou University, um, he was basically saying that um, the, and and you know, and he has connections with the Chinese Communist Party. So it, it's likely that, you know, his comments were at least somewhat approved or endorsed. Started threatening Australia with nuclear weapons should we acquire these, uh, these uh, uh, nuclear powered submarines. So I think we need to bear that, bear that in mind as well. Um, you know, when we look at the, the, look at the big picture. All right, thank you. We have a question from Edward Chan, who's uh, it's addressed to Justin and Peter. So what, us, so what, should Australia do, say, your top three priorities to make Australia safer within Australia, the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean in the next five years, uh, given that we have a limited defense budget? Um, and if we are so committing so, if we're committing so much of that defense budget to submarines, Edward doesn't mention, of course, the uh, Joint Strike Fighter, um, the F-35, but, you know, what does that mean for Australians' um, ability to make uh, uh, to have a defensive policy that's not just, you know, safe in terms of strategic, but also economic and, you know, all the other things, prosperity. So Peter and Justin, or Justin, Peter, whoever would like to go first. I think in terms of what, what would make Australia safer, I mean, the, you know, there's always a question, anytime you talk about procurement of weapons, you know, you're obviously, this is obviously such a long timeline that there's really nothing that you can do now to make you safer, given you're saying, well, I'm going to acquire this in, in 20 years. Um, you know, what can you do now? Um, Australia, as you know, I think others have pointed out here, already has, I think, productive relationships in, in the region, um, you know, especially with, you know, Japan and now India. Um, they have, you know, sort of a, a good relationship with South Korea. Um, they have a number of um, strategic partnerships in Southeast Asia. And, you know, especially in Southeast Asia, those partnerships uh, exist, but could be further strengthened, right? Um, and, you know, sort of some of the, even some of the countries that are more skeptical of Australia's nuclear submarines, I think would be open to, to better relations. And so, I mean, in some sense, the, I think there's this, there's this tendency to think, well, if, if, the US, if Australia is allied with the US and the UK, that means they can't be a, you know, active in, in, in Asia uh, as an Asian country, but I, I'm not sure that's really accurate, right? And I, I think sort of there's no real, um, nothing really holding Australia back from becoming more enmeshed within, within Asian regional security in an active way. Uh, and it's something that Australia has not particularly been good at over the long term. But, it, you know, if you want to um, commit to, you know, sort of making Australia safer in the next five years, certainly a low cost, um, a low cost solution is simply being to reinvigorating and deepening those relationships in, in East and Southeast Asia. If this deal were to be implemented, there would be an immense opportunity cost for the Australian Defence Forces, all the things that we couldn't do as a result. Uh, I think the most important thing to do is to modernise and upgrade our maritime and air forces that can provide a rapid response in the maritime approaches to the North Australian coast and provide a sense of uh, real surveillance and rapid response to the rest of our enormously long coastline. Uh, to my mind, the way to do that is with primarily surface ships, uh, aircraft with anti-ship missiles, uh, our own satellites and surveillance capability, um, and some airborne uh, anti-submarine warfare forces. Um, that This is you know, a long-standing debate in Canberra um, I think that's where you'll find most of the long-standing defense analysts will be worried about what's really going to happen to Australian security in the next 20 to 40 years if we go down this pathway, as against the idea that Japan is simply going to be what, it, what it's been since the Cold War, during the Cold War, which was uh, as a famous 
statement from the Japanese prime minister at the time was that it's an aircraft carrier uh, uh, for the United States. Well, we would just become a matching submarine port for uh, American uh, submarine operations as an adjunct uh, bit player. When we look at the quad, I mean, I'm really struck. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of talk. But when it really comes down to it, the real pointy end at the moment of the quad is ostensibly COVID response. And the COVID response has boiled down to the idea that uh, the United States would kick in some vaccines for global distribution. Uh, and uh, we would make a lot of vaccine in India and that Australia would provide the global logistics for delivery. I mean, this is risible. This is not power in any meaningful sense. And this is not just a sort of momentary transient issue. We are now in a permanent pandemic era, and we've got this really insipid response from the Quad matching China's vaccine diplomacy, whatever you think of it, boy, have they been efficient. So to my mind, we're just playing the wrong game altogether. We need to get back to basics. We need to be going back to Neville Shute on the beach. He pretty much got it right. What happens if you go down that pathway? Yeah. Uh, and we need to uh, say to the United States and its partners, um, you know, please don't blow up the world in the Northern Hemisphere uh, China is a very complicated topic. I, I mean, I could say a lot about China. I first went to China in 1975. Uh, and all I can say at this point is that we are far less at risk of war and global war facing China than we ever were with respect to the former Soviet Union. It's a much less dangerous world. And there are many, many ways to engage China, which is consumed with internal issues uh, and we can actually exploit some of those problems to effect if we're looking for coercive power. Uh, Australia, at the moment, if we really wanted to stand up to this trade war, uh, could actually play silly buggers with iron supply to China, but we're not actually willing to go where there's real coercive power. Uh, we're, we're really committed to these rhetorical games. And I'll sort of conclude by saying on the psychological question that was raised by the first uh, question, what I see here is essentially a form of swagger uh, where our uh, national leader is attempting to look tough, uh, be a big power leader, play rugby with the, uh, with the big boys, and none of that pretty boy AFL game from down south uh, this is all about offsetting COVID failures in the next election, splitting the Labour Party. And in my humble opinion, this whole deal is going to fall over. It's just going to leave a protracted flatulence and do a lot of damage along the way. We're going to finish with uh, a question from Gabriela Abondadza, who asks, well, first she says, thanks everyone for a great discussion, which I echo to all of our panelists. My question, do the panelists think that AUKUS will drive a significant wedge between allies and partners that seek to curb China's rise? I guess the sense that we're shooting ourselves in the foot there. I am thinking of large European countries like France, Italy, and Germany. I'm glad, I'm sure Italy's glad to be presented into the, uh, or upgraded to that category, but also of the EU as a whole. So, you know, people just, I've seen a lot of you know, views on the Twitter sphere in Australia, sort of dismissing the French as just being bad tempered. Uh, this will pass. But is there kind of a blind spot in that viewpoint that Europe matters as an as a entity, as a rising power in its own right these days, particularly after the Trump presidency, seeing that its future has to be based more on a, a self-dependency uh, as opposed to an interdependency? Anyways, um, that's a question for Gabriella, who would uh, aim, would you like to tackle that or anybody else? I'm just short, quick um, responses uh, as the last question. I'm not a Europe expert, sorry. I'm have to pass on this one. Okay, well, when we, we'll come back for a Southeast Asia one when we have the next, uh, we do have uh, some future ones coming up on the Global Forum. Others would like to respond to this question. Anyone in particular about Europe and 
the um, issue of the European Union. Yes, Tom. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, uh, I think, you know, European countries individually and the EU um, uh, as a whole have been very um, forward leaning over the whole Indo-Pacific concept, uh, concept um, and uh, develop their own Indo-Pacific strategies. So there is a role for them to play. Um, uh, one thing that really stands out there is the EU-Japan Strategic Partnership and Economic Partnership Agreement. So again, that plugs into this network of countries that are kind of like-minded countries that subscribe to this free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, of which Australia, the United States, Japan, you know, all of these countries are sort of coming together on the same page. Um, I really don't think that it's, um, I mean, obviously, you know, Paris is is, is peaked with, uh, with with Canberra at this moment, but it's not going to give up, you know, it's not it's not going to stop them from cooperating, you know, in, in whatever capacity they can. It's, France is still an important player, but probably, I mean, in terms of its sort of uh, naval capabilities um, and its sort of friends and partnerships, bi-power defence agreement, uh, you know, close relationship with Australia and everything, um, the, the UK is a, a more important partner to Australia than, than, um, than France is. So, I mean, if you've got to choose one or the other, then the, the choice is fairly obvious. Uh, not sure about Italy. I mean, Italy can obviously play a role, but uh, um, uh, <laughs> but we'll have to see how that manifests itself. Brendan, yes. Yeah, please. just a quick word. I noticed James Curran had an article in the Australian Financial Review today questioning Australia being sort of locked in with Boris Johnson's plans to find a sort of post-Brexit place for the for the UK and the world. I think that's something to be skeptical about as well. Um, that this, you know, he's an actor that you wouldn't want to be too closely tied with in, in rhetoric and style and also, you know, strategic sense. So I think that, you know, there are lots of reasons to be skeptical, but of course, this is early, early days. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I think we covered the whole issue of friends, enemies, and interest. As I said at the outset, we were using this as an opportunity to zoom out, frame the question, ask some critical, uh, I think, uncomfortable questions to the easy platitudes we've been getting and also the hot-headed remarks in the press. And I think we've done that today, and I want to thank you all. And we will pursue this. We are going to do um, a series of webinars attached to this theme uh, of the Global Forum 2021. I want to thank uh, Jose Toyaba and our new project officer, Claire Stevens, for putting this together on the fly. It's never easy when you know, you're in lockdown. I want to thank all of you who, you know, you have children at home, you're homeschooling still and dealing with a lot. And to take time out to do this is a, is a big sacrifice. And I appreciate it um, deeply. And I, I'm sure our audience, which was considerable today, I'm quite impressed. So obviously, this is a theme that touches on a lot of people's concerns right now. And um, so we're going to continue to address it. So stay tuned. Uh, we hope to have uh, the next one up and running in, in three weeks. And um, in the meantime, uh, be safe, be well, and uh, over and out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.